This morning we are going to sing our message in music together as a congregation because it is about America and about uh, how our God has blessed this country. So if you have your hymn, take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 641. And let's stand together and let's sing all four verses of America the Beautiful. songs, faith of our fathers, and find us faithful. Those, may those who come behind us find us faithful. Our scripture passage this morning is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. And I'll be reading from the new King James Version, uh, as actually is a personal preference this morning, because I like the way it says it. <laughs> Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who is the author of our story. I thank you, Father, that you are writing this story and that nothing we do on any given day surprises you. Father, we thank you that you are who you are. We thank you that you love us so much. We thank you that you are working in our lives to work all things together for good because you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you're going to do as well as all that you've done in our lives. Open our hearts this morning to hear your voice, to hear your words, and to respond as you would have us to. In Christ I pray. Amen. I like sports. Uh, I don't know about you. Do you like sports? I, I'm a sports fan. I like to watch sports on television. Not all sports. I don't like to watch bowling. You ever been to a cookout for a bowling game? I to watch on TV. Your house for? <laughs> see, a hand went up. <laughs> well, I have it. Um, but I have done that for uh, football games and baseball games. Um, many people will be, do, will be doing that this afternoon for a soccer game. Um, sports television, like all television, likes to connect the viewer to the athlete. And in particular, connect the emotion. There needs to be emotional connection. Oftentimes we'll hear... Uh, stories of how athletes overcame uh, impossible hurdles to get to where they are uh, in their life and, 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 and um, in the game. Um, I enjoy those stories. Some of them are very interesting and entertaining. Others, frankly, are, are just distasteful. My favorite part of the photographs are the videos showing the concentration and the intensity on the faces of the athletes. Men and women who are disciplined and chiseled and prepared to give everything they have. That, that's especially the case with the Olympic Games. Because sometimes you have people who prepared for all of their lives for what's going to happen in the next 30 seconds. And that is just so Amazing to me. I love that. I love that intensity. Well, God has called Christians to live that kind of life. He's called us to be ready. He's called us to a life of discipline and preparedness and intentionality. The book of Hebrews is an anonymous book. We don't know who wrote it. If you think you know who wrote it, you don't. No one knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. But here's what we do know. We do know that Hebrews clearly confirms the majesty and the deity of Jesus Christ. And in this passage, God calls Christians to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. God called the early church to strive to serve Jesus with the same intensity of running a race. Listen, not just to finish a race, but to win a race. God calls us to be winners. And He calls us to the same action and to the same intensity. So the question today is simple. How do you do it? How do we do that? This passage will provide for us four answers to that question. 
First of all, we run with a cloud of witnesses. First of all, we're not alone. We're not the only ones who have run this race. Chapter 12 begins with a key verse. Therefore. And we always have to see what the therefore is a therefore in the Bible. And this therefore connects chapter 12 with one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is that great hall of faith. And there is only one hall of faith in all of the Bible. And it's Hebrews chapter 11. The chapter begins with the definition of faith and then follows with a long series of examples of real people demonstrating faith. So if the author was defining faith and offering demonstrations of faith in chapter 11, he's making application of that faith in chapter 12. The common denominator in all of those named in, in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 is that they all trusted God. With all, of they had, with, with all they had and all they were, they trusted God. But we don't have to look back 2,000 years or 4,000 years or 6,000 years to find people who trusted God. We can just look back two, three, four weeks ago. We just have to look to Charleston. That's what we see there. People who go beyond trusting in their emotions, they trusted in God. They're trusting in God. The important thing is that we remind ourselves of the necessity of faith. Faith is a necessity for a follower of Jesus. It's not something that's nice to have. It's not that we need a little faith. No, we need all faith. It's not just something that will help us. It's something we need. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So it's impossible for us to live a Christian life. It's impossible for us to fulfill the mission, the vision of Northgate Baptist Church apart from faith. Because this is not the Lions Club. It's not the Rotary Club. It's not a club at all. It's the church of the living God. And it requires faith to serve the Lord. It's the desire of Northgate Baptist Church to be the most effective and the most efficient team possible to take the gospel to our communities and even to the nations. And to do that will require great faith. Well, secondly, we run with efficiency. Northgate Baptist Church is God's church. It's God's church. The Lord Jesus Christ paid for it with His blood on Calvary's cross. The church belongs to Jesus. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. We refer to it as our church. I understand that. But it's not ours. It belongs to the Lord. We're simply the stewards of it for this generation. In this great race, the baton has been placed in our hand today. Soon, and very soon, sooner than we think, we'll hand the baton to the next generation. And it's our stewardship responsibility to hand it in better shape than we found it. We received it. That means we have a tremendous responsibility. Actually, it's a greater responsibility than any of us can possibly handle. It's greater. It's greater than we can handle. Winning this community to faith in Jesus Christ is more than any of us individually or collectively can do. We've been given a God-sized task. We've been given an impossible task. To win the upstate region, to win Greenville, South Carolina, to faith in Christ, that's an impossible task for us. We can't do it without God. We can't do it without faith, great faith in God that goes far beyond ourselves and our own abilities. 
Only God can win men, women, boys, and girls to Himself. Only God can do that. But He's ordained. <laughs> but He does it through us. That's His plan. Now, it's His work. But He does His work through us. God almost always works through people. Sometimes He works through donkeys. But almost always, He works through people. He doesn't have to, but that's usually the way God works. He chooses to work through people who believe and have faith and trust in Him. So because God wants to reach this community and He wants to do it through us, we need something that will unite us together. We need something that will get us on the same page. And certainly that begins with Scripture. It begins with the Word of God. But application of the Scriptures is made through vision. And that's why Northgate's vision statement is in your bulletin today. Because we need to be reminded of our vision, which is based upon God's Word. And so we have a copy of Northgate Baptist Church's vision statement in our bulletin today. It's our plan to achieve the great commission, the great commandments through Northgate. Vision, vision is the intersection between God's Word and our values and our goal to impact our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what vision is. Vision is the intersection between God's Word and our values and our goal to impact our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The beauty of vision is that it allows us to say no to good things so that we can say yes to the best things. If we're going to reach, if we're going to reach this community, even the world, we're going to have to be very efficient. So if there's anything that would hinder the light of the gospel of Jesus from shining through us, we need to get rid of it. And that includes attitudes that aren't based on faith in Jesus, that aren't based on the kingdom of God, that aren't based on, on, on reaching people with the gospel of Jesus. Sin hinders the effectiveness and the efficiency of Christians and churches. You see, time is simply too short. Doesn't time fly by? Time just flies by. The older you get, the more you realize that. Time just flies. There's just not enough of it. Time is too short. The task is too important for us to allow anything to entangle us and to make us ineffective as witnesses for Jesus Christ. The priority of our ministries, and you see that in the vision statement. I hope you'll read that. The priority of our, of our ministries must be focused on winning souls. No other goal, no matter how important it may seem, measures up. It'll always fall short. God's vision is that we invite people to place their faith in Jesus Christ. And that can't happen. That can't happen when we allow lesser things to take our focus off the gospel of Christ. Thirdly, we run with endurance. We run with endurance. Living for Christ is not easy. As a matter of fact, in 2015, living for the Lord Jesus Christ is the epitome of counterculture. When I was growing up, I grew up in the Atlanta, Georgia area. My parents, when I was a little boy, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, my parents would take me to Piedmont Park. Anybody familiar with Atlanta? Piedmont Park in the late 60s, early 70s. You know who lived there? 
kidneys. And they would take me down to Piedmont Park and I would see the hippies. And they were just different. But my parents exposed me to that this counterculture. They were against the establishment. They would carry signs. They would uh, do things that we didn't do at home. They were counterculture. Well, in 2015, being a Bible-believing follower of Jesus Christ is about as counterculture as you can possibly get. If you want to be different, live for Jesus. That's why it's a good thing that things are, are getting tough to be a Christian in America. That's why we embrace that. Because the harder it gets, the more we'll stand out. Real Christians. So we embrace that. We embrace, we embrace the persecution. Because the harder it gets, the more we're going to stand out. And the more we're going to draw people to ourselves. Serving Jesus is hard work. And when a church begins to be effective for the advancement of the kingdom of God, we can expect the enemy to attack. And Northgate has been growing in recent years. Many people have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Many more have joined in what God is doing here at Northgate. And the angels are shouting, and that great cloud of witnesses are shouting, but Satan's not. He's not shouting. He's not celebrating at least. Think about it. Satan hates you. You ever thought about that? We, know, we, we, we oftentimes think about God loves me. And God loves me with a perfect love. With an unconditional love. And that's comforting and that's true. But Satan hates you. And he hates me. And he hates us with a perfect hatred with unconditional hatred. There's nothing we'll ever do that can stop Satan from hating us. He hates us perfectly. He's very good at hating. He hates God, he hates God's church, and he really hates it when God's church grows. And every time someone is saved, a soul is snatched out of his hand forever. Forever. He knows he'll never get that soul back. Never, ever. And Satan hates to lose. So one of the things you really, you really have to kind of tip your hat to Satan. He hates to lose. He's consistent. He's a hard worker. He hates to lose. Now, he's a loser. He has lost, and he will lose. But he hates it. And he hates to lose souls to the Lord. He'll do everything in his power to make this church, your life, my life, ineffective for the gospel's sake so they can stop the church from going forward. He'll do everything in his power to quench the work of the Holy Spirit in this place, in your life, in my life. You see, there is such a thing as spiritual warfare. There's a war going on. And you're in it. And so am I. And reaching people for Jesus, every time we open our mouths and share our testimony, we're putting ourselves on the front line. We, we become high priority targets for Satan when we become a witness for Christ. And understand, Satan doesn't care what we do at church. Just as long as no one gets saved. We can entertain one another. We can make this a happy place. We can have fun. Just as long as no one goes from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Satan wants people to remain lost and on the way to hell, and he wants saved people to live like lost people. That's what he wants. He wants saved people to walk by flesh and to look at our abilities and to do what we can do. 
Because that traps us. Doesn't want us to walk by faith. Doesn't want us to live by faith. He wants us to do what we know we can do. He wants, to live, he wants us to live out of our own limitations. Satan wants to destroy us. Wants to tear us apart. He wants to destroy our witness. He wants to destroy our ability, or God's ability to grow His kingdom through us. He wants to take us out of the fight. So he tempts us to sin. One of the most damaging sins, we think about sin, we talk about sin, we have our own list. You have your list, I have my list. We all have the list. What we need to do is look at God's list. There's several lists of sins in the Bible. Paul gives us many. The, the most extensive one is in Romans chapter 1. That's the longest list of sins in the Bible, in the New Testament. The sin that's mentioned there more often than any other sin is the sin of speech, gossip. Gossip, Paul says, is the cancer of the church. It's the most dangerous of all the sins. You see, and here's the thing that, that sometimes we don't understand. Gossip can be true. Gossip doesn't have to be a lie. Gossip can be true, but its intent is always to hurt someone or to tear them down. And one of, one of Satan's cruelest yet most effective strategies is to take one of our greatest resources and turn it into a tool of, for gossip. He tempts, to hide, he tempts us to hide gossip in the form of prayer requests. Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about their marriage? You know what's going on? Let me tell you what's going on. She did this and he did that. Well, just pray for them. That's called gossip. And it's destructive. Listen, folks, just don't do it. It always plays in to the hands of Satan. Like Mama said, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, don't say anything at all. If someone asks you to pray for them, then pray for them. That means you tell it to God, not others. If they want others to know, they'll tell others. They wanted you to know so that you could pray for them, so you pray with them and then you pray for them. If they want you to tell someone, they'll tell you. Otherwise, just don't gossip because it always plays in to Satan's hands. That's why Paul talked about it so much in the New Testament. So how do we battle? How do we win this spiritual warfare? How do we win in that? Well, we're going to need a plan. And any time we need a plan, as Christians, we turn to the plan book of the Bible. There's a plan book. You know that? It's the book of James. The book of James is the plan book. And it's the, it has the plan for spiritual warfare. That's James chapter 4 and verse 7. James chapter 4 and verse 7. And it reads like this. Therefore, submit to God. And then there's a period. There's a punctuation mark after God. Therefore, submit to God, period. The next word is resist with a capital R. It's a new sentence, a new thought. Therefore, submit to God, period. Before you do anything else, you have to submit to God. Then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Will the devil flee from you if you 
do not submit to God? No. Because you're not strong enough, and I'm not strong enough to do battle with Him. But God is. So we submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from us. That sounds very, very simple, but I'm just telling you, everything the Bible has to say about spiritual warfare comes down to that one verse. James 4, 7. You can do a 13-week study on it, or you can study James 4, 7. It all comes down to that verse. Strive for holiness. Submit to God. John the Baptist said it probably best. He must increase and I must decrease. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Resist the temptation to sin. Love God. Love one another. Be quick to forgive one another. That's also in James. James is the plan book. Don't allow bitterness. Don't allow anger or gossip to destroy your effectiveness for Jesus Christ. Don't allow Satan to dictate what you'll do and when you'll do it. Listen, as a follower of Jesus, Satan has only what we give him. Satan has only what we give him. So don't give him anything. And he has no recourse. He loves it when we're, when we're angry for righteousness' sake. He loves that. He feeds off that. He loves it when we want to get revenge, even when we're right. He has no answer for forgiveness. He has no answer for love. If you want to win in spiritual warfare, love and forgive. And we need lots of that. Satan will do everything in his power, anything, to make Northgate Baptist Church, to make you and to make me ineffective for the Lord. So just resist him. Refuse to play into his hands. Growing a church is hard work. It calls for endurance. It calls for submission. It calls for God to work through us. Finally, we run for our king. Verse 2 says, look unto Jesus. We're not running this race for ourselves. We're running this race for the Lord Jesus Christ because he ran it and he won it for us. So Christ is worth whatever trials, whatever tribulations we might face in this life to do his work. Being on team Jesus means we're on the winning team. Understand, if you're a follower of Jesus, no matter matter how bad you may feel today, you're a winner. You win. Team Jesus wins. It's not our church, it's God's church. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's commanded us to manage it for His purposes and not our purpose. And when we seek First, the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we can expect, always expect, Satan to attack. 1 John 4, verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. That's truth. We need truth. Focus on truth, not lies. When we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, we can expect to be blessed more than we could have ever possibly imagined. So God's vision for Northgate Baptist Church is to tell every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in the Greenville, South Carolina area about Jesus Christ. One of the ways we'll do that is through Vacation Bible School. Pray for Vacation Bible School every day now. We're in the home stretch. It begins a week from today. And we need to pray. 25%, I'm going to share this, this, I'm I'm stealing from next week. 25% of all of those baptized in Southern Baptist churches are baptized through VBS ministry. It's just that important. We are running in a great race. We're running with a great cloud of witnesses and we're running 
to win. And God has called us to run with efficiency. He's called us to run with endurance. And He's called us not to just finish it. He's called us to win it. Because He's already won it. We're winners. We ought to live like it. We ought to behave like it. We're not losers. We're winners. So we ought to live like it. And we ought to behave like it. We ought to look and act like our King. Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we want to be yours. We want to be used by you for the furtherance of your kingdom on this earth. Father, forgive us when we allow Satan to tempt us. It always draws our attention off of you and onto ourselves or onto something else. Oh God, forgive us and restore us. Father, we repent of the sin that is so easily that so easily ensnares us and encumbers us from being what you've saved us to be. Lord, this is your church. And we pray, God, that you would use it as you would to bring men, women, boys, and girls to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we love you. And we confess that we have you. Lord, we have an impossible task before us on our own. Impossible. There's no way that we can win this community to you. Only you can do that. And you've chosen to do it through us. So, Father, may we surrender all that we have and all that we are to you. And run this race. Submit to you. And run this race for your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're here today and, and, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You have that opportunity today. You're here and, and you're just not sure that you're a Christ follower. You're just not sure that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. Now, you want to be sure, you want that assurance, you want that security, but you just don't have it. You can have it today. You can come today and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and your Lord. He'll give you a brand new life. That happened to me. I wasn't sure. I didn't know. I was afraid. And God gave me a new life, and, he, and that fear went away. And God gave me a purpose, direction. He'll do the same for you. If you're not sure, place your faith in Jesus today. Or maybe you are a Christian and you've been living by sight more than by faith. You've been basing your decisions upon what you can do, not what God can do through you. Repent of that. That's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to live for Him. When we were saved, we died to ourselves. We gave Him our life, and He gave, him, he gave us His life. We need to allow Him to live His life through us because it's not our life. It's not, it's not our church. It's not our life. It belongs to Jesus. He paid for it. If you've been living your life for you, repent of that. Turn away from that and turn to Jesus. Maybe God's calling you to join Northgate. And come alongside of us. You come. However God is calling, you come as the Lord calls. You have that opportunity this morning. Richard, come and lead us in an invitation hymn. Would you please stand?